president at CSIS. Uh, for the last several years, we've had a great debate in this country that has not resolved itself in the right way. We have, we have two contending uh, priorities. We want the government to protect us, and Americans want to be protected from their government. You know, these are two things that have been with us for 250 years. And, and we've worked that out. We had a working formula that resolved all of that, but that consensus broke down badly in the last decade. And so we have General Alexander walking in to probably the most crucial job that we need to have done at a time when we don't have, we the, the policy <coughs> leaders, don't have a consensus on how to manage this. This is going to be the great challenge. So it, it, fortunately, we have uh, a man of his talent and his experience that's going to help us. He not only has to build a new organization, but he also has to help build a, the confidence and a consensus in the United States that we need this role, and it's a crucial role for the country. So I, I'm very grateful, uh, General Alexander, that you would join us. This has been long in coming. You see the the depth of interest in this topic, and we, rather than my delaying it, we look forward to hearing your words, and then I hope you'll, you'll uh, give us the benefit also of sharing Q&A, and Jim will take care of fielding those questions for you. So thank you for coming. He must have been standing on something, because this was way up there. <laughs> Sir, thanks, uh, thanks for that introduction, and Thank you as well for your leadership and service to our nation, not only at the Department of Defense, but also here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. You helped spark the discussions on cyberspace issues in the 1990s under the Clinton administration, and with experts like Jim Lewis, CSIS is continuing to show leadership in this field. Indeed, CSIS December 2008 report, securing cyberspace for the 44th presidency, served as a key thread of continuity across two administrations and really set the foundation for crafting this administration's strategy for cyber and security. Thank you as well for the opportunity to speak here today. As this is my first public engagement since I've been promoted and assuming uh, the command of U.S. Cyber Command, I am pleased to be here with all of you today and can think of no better place to talk about cyberspace and U.S. Cybercom than here at CSIS. But before I talk about uh, U.S. Cybercom and focus on the Defense Department, let me state up front that cybersecurity is a team sport. And I see a lot of the team out here in the, in the audience. We can't do this alone. Within the government, Howard Schmidt has the lead for coordinating the departments and agencies and our approach to cybersecurity. He has done a superb job and has been great to work with. For the team at DHS, Phil Reidinger, Rear Admiral Mike Brown, and others have been great partners on a set of very complex issues. All of us in government recognize that government cannot do this without the help of industry, academia, and our allies. Securing cyberspace is a team sport, and we are proud to be a member of that team. We look forward to growing the partnership as we collectively address how we should secure our networks. Let me talk about our portion of the team and our roles and responsibilities. Two weeks ago, I was privileged to participate in the activation of U.S. Cyber Command. As Dr. Hamry said, a task long in the making and longer overdue. I think it was a brief confirmation process that we went through. That was a joke, I'm sorry. I won't, I'll, I'll, <laughs> no more jokes. In 2005, uh, the director of NSA was dual-hatted as director of NSA and the commander of the Joint Functional Component Command, Net Warfare. The commander of the Defense Information Systems Agency was dual-hatted as commander of the Joint Task Force Global Network Operations. In late 2008, as a result of a serious intrusions into our classified networks, the Secretary of Defense decided to place the Joint Task Force Global Network Ops under my operational control as the commander of the Joint Functional Component Command, Net Warfare, recognizing both the imperative for better synchronization, synchronizing our offensive and defensive cyber capabilities as, the well, as well as the need to leverage 
NSA's intelligence capabilities to support our understanding of the threat and the ability to respond to it. Last June, the Secretary of Defense directed the stand-up of U.S. Cyber Command to further strengthen this model and streamline the command and control of our military's cyber capabilities. Since that time, we have been leaning forward in building an organization and a mission alignment that is more integrated, synchronized, and effective in the support of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, and civilians. On May 21st, that came together in the activation of U.S. Cyber Command. We at Cyber Command are responsible day to day for directing the operations and defense of the Department of Defense Information Networks and for the systemic and adaptive planning, integration, and synchronization of cyber activities and when directed under the authority of the President, the Secretary of Defense, and the Commander of U.S. STRATCOM for conducting full-spectrum military cyberspace operations to ensure U.S. and allied freedom of action in cyberspace. That is quite a mouthful. I have difficulty saying it. I'm an Army officer. Reading is difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Partly it means that U.S. Cyber Command will centralize command of military cyberspace operations, strengthen DOD cyberspace capabilities, and integrate and bolster DOD cyber expertise. Deputy Secretary of Defense William Lynn explained our mission concisely last week. We will lead the day-to-day -day defense of all military networks, support military and counterterrorism missions, and under the leadership of the Department of Homeland Security, assist other government, civil authorities, and industry partners. As Secretary Lynn put it, the key part of Cyber Command is the linking of intelligence, offense, and defense under one roof. It's that simple, right? Well, actually, no. It's not so simple at all, and it certainly will not be easy. The easy and simple stuff was done long ago. We got the rest. We have an enormous challenge ahead of us as a nation, as a department, and as a command. If I may, I'd like to sketch out some of our thinking on the interrelated set of issues that we call cyberspace and on how we hope to sort these issues, I hope, resolve some of the more urgent demand issues. Cyberspace consists of vexingly complex systems that ship and store unimaginably vast amounts of data. By 2015, the number of network hosts is expected to exceed the human population. As Harry Radigy knows, I'm doing my part to, com to compete against that with 12 grandchildren, <laughs> but it won't work. Social networking and instant messaging accounts are exploding. By the end of 2010, Radicati Group projects that there will be 2.2 billion social network accounts worldwide and currently 2.4 billion instant messaging accounts. By 2014, they project that there will be over 3.7 billion social networking accounts and over 3.5 billion instant messaging accounts. In 1996, there were 16 million Internet users worldwide. Today, there are approximately 1.8 billion Internet users across the globe. In 2009, there were a total of 90 trillion emails sent. And in 2010, around 247 billion emails sent every day. Of those, 247 billion emails, 200 billion were spam. You might ask how I know that. I got, <laughs> I got all the spam ones in on my home account. I think we share those. Geographically speaking, those email users are probably not where you think they are. 47% are in Asia, 23% from Europe, and only 14% from North America and 16% from other locations around the globe. In a sense, we humans are tying together all the libraries on our planet and making them accessible from everywhere instantly. The data in that common library of humanity increasingly form the basis of our economic wealth and contribute to our quality of life. 
tremendous opportunities for the future, and tremendous vulnerabilities. Our data must be protected. No one here or anywhere else would consent to having all their personal and family information stored in a place where any random stranger could rummage through it. No business or nonprofit enterprise, and certainly no nation, could long afford to leave its trade secrets, donor lists, or diplomatic bargaining positions lying around exposed. And yet, that is what, in essence, is happening more and more as the ways we use to protect our personal, enterprise, and national security data are compromised by carelessness, poor design, and subterfuge. We now live in a world where a nation's security depends in no small part on the security awareness and practices of our agencies, firms, suppliers, schools, friends, neighbors, relatives, and, well, all of us. Cyberspace has become a critical enabler for all elements of national and military power. As President Obama's national security strategy states, our digital infrastructure, therefore, is a strategic national asset and protecting it while safeguarding privacy and civil liberties is a national security priority. The comprehensive national cyber initiative, which has been forged and implemented under two administrations now, is our guide for doing this. Today, our nation's interests are in jeopardy. The technologic convergence of automated data processing and telecommunications has boosted productivity and opportunity, but it has also introduced tremendous vulnerabilities and created new challenges. It is not alarmist to say that the weakest link in our security can seriously impact our ability to operate securely and with confidence in cyberspace. America's very wealth and strength make it a target in cyberspace, and one of the pillars of that strength, our military, is at risk, perhaps to an even greater degree. Our military depends on its network for command and control, communications, intelligence, operations, and logistics. We in the Department of Defense have more than 7 million machines to protect, linked in 15,000 networks with 21 satellite gateways and 20,000 commercial circuits composed of countless devices and components. National and military information infrastructures, moreover, are increasingly intertwined. They include the Internet, telecommunications network, computer systems, and embedded processors and controllers in critical industries. That infrastructure is a sophisticated and robust, is, is sophisticated and robust, but it also has its weak points. DOD systems are probed by unauthorized users approximately 250,000 times an hour, over 6 million times a day. And while our frontline defenses are up to this challenge, we still have to devote too much of our time and resources to dealing with relatively mundane problems such as poorly engineered software, missing patches, and poor configuration. You are all familiar with the general outlines of the threats to network security from a growing array of foreign actors, terrorists, criminal groups, and individual hackers. Indeed, these outlines are no secret to analysts inside and outside government and are being treated and studied by industry efforts like Verizon's business risk team. In the data breaches that Verizon investigated last year, and remember these were only reported cases, not all breaches, they found that criminal organizations, often using custom-built malware, are able to breach virtually every single organization they choose. A, relatively handful, a relative handful of such attacks accounted for the vast preponderance of the 285 million records that the Verizon investigators determined to be compromised. And the main limitations on the abilities of these criminal organizations were time and resources. They simply did not have the time and the wherewithal to breach all the high-value targets they could have, and thus they apparently concentrated on what they deemed the most profitable ones. Those are just the criminal organizations. We should assume 
that foreign government actors in cyberspace have both considerably more resources and even more worrisome motivations than cyber criminals. In short, we face a dangerous combination of known and unknown vulnerabilities, strong adversary capabilities, and weak situational awareness. The trends seem to be evolving in other ways that should also give us concern. A decade ago, network penetration seemed targeted mostly at exploiting data. In the last few years, we saw the bar of conduct lowered for computer network attacks. In Estonia, in 2007, and in Georgia in 2008, distributed denial of service attacks impeded government functions. And as I told Dr. Hamry, I think they also delayed me getting here. <laughs> now there are hints that some penetrations are targeting systems for remote sabotage. Let me explain. Estonia and Georgia were distributed denial of service attacks. Once these attacks stopped, the information systems were able to continue on with their job. But the potential for sabotage and destruction is now possible and something we must treat very seriously. And these threats are serious. To deal with them will require common vision, unity of effort, and a commitment of dedicated resources. Our Department of Defense must be able to operate freely and defend its resources in cyberspace. We will do this as we will do this as we do it in the traditional military domains of land, sea, air, and space. But cyberspace is unique. It is a man-made domain. It is also an increasingly contested domain. That makes everything even tougher. Our job in U.S. Cyber Command is to assure the right information gets to the right user at the right time and the right level of protection. U.S. Cyber Command enables the Defense Department to better operate and protect our DOD information networks and remains the focal point for military cyberspace operations in collaboration with other components of the U.S. government. Its contribution represents a substantial share of what the Department offers as part of a whole government approach to deter, detect, and defend against emerging threats to our nation in cyberspace. How will we do our job? As I mentioned earlier, we consolidated two already existing staffs, the Joint Functional Component Command for Net Warfare and the Joint Task Force Global Network Operations. Recently, we established a single, coherent, Cyber Joint Operations Center bringing together the capabilities of these two staffs, and we are currently executing command and control of our information networks from Fort Meade. U.S. Cyber Command is co-located with the National Security Agency, which it is also my privilege to lead. NSA's capabilities, and more importantly, its people in the intelligence and information assurance fields are unsurpassed. This intellectual and technological capital is critical to the success of the entire U.S. government efforts in cyberspace. U.S. Cyber Command is a military command that falls under Title X, but its business relies on the success of net speed intelligence which is why co-locating the command with NSA was not only wise, but an imperative. I know that some have concerns about intelligence community involvement in securing the nation's cyber infrastructure. Those concerns are valid, which is why the professionals at the National Security Agency have robust and rigorous procedures to minimize the effects of intelligence activities upon U.S. persons. NSA also has an experience in energetic oversight both internally and from the Department of Justice, the FISA Court, and from Congress. This explains why co-location of Cyber Command with those same professionals is perhaps the best way to ensure the transparency of operations that can affect U.S. persons' data and the protection of privacy and civil liberties is our military operations in cyberspace. As of May 21st, U.S. Cyber Command also gained service elements to be boots on the ground in support of its mission. These include the Army Forces Cyber Command, the Marine Forces Cyber Command, the 24th Air Force, and the Navy's 10th Fleet, Fleet Cyber Command under Vice Admiral Barry McCullough, who I understand spoke to you just a few months ago. While technology is part of the solution, of course, 
but the key is people. And we have superb people, both at NSA and at US Cyber Command. But one of our greatest challenges will be successfully recruiting, training, and retaining our cyber cadre to ensure that we can sustain our ability to operate effectively in cyberspace for the long term. This is one of the key focus areas identified in the recent quadrennial defense review. The need to develop greater cyber expertise. The QDR identified three other key imperatives for operating effectively in cyberspace. One, we must develop a comprehensive approach to DOD operations in cyberspace. Two, we must centralize command of cyber operations. And three, finally, we must enhance partnerships with other agencies and the government. This last point merits particular elaboration. Our mission at Cyber Command includes not only the defense of our military networks, but also a role in guarding our nation's defense industrial base. More than 90% of our military's energy is, de uh, is generated and distributed by the private sector. And more than 80% of our logistics are transported by private companies. Mission critical systems are designed, built, and often maintained by defense contractors. The military's networks are not neatly bounded by those ending in the dot mill. We rely on private sector networks and capabilities. Hence, ensuring that those partners and allies, networks are secured is a key concern because the flow of information crossing these networks is significant and sensitive. Our adversaries will find our weakest link and exploit it, whether it is public or privately owned and operated. That being said, any efforts to secure DOD mission critical networks will be carefully designed to avoid providing preferential treatment to any particular private sector company. Perhaps most importantly, this is an action that we need to do in partnership with DHS. At US Cyber Command, we will approach these tasks by ensuring the right balance of integrated cyber and technical capabilities. We will pull together existing cyberspace resources to create better synergy and synchronization of warfighting effects to defend DOD's information networks. We are integrating defense, offense, operations and will leverage technical capabilities to provide coherent effects to strategic, operational, and tactical commanders. All of these steps support the armed services' ability to conduct high-tempo, effective operations while protecting command and control systems and cyber infrastructure. In closing, I'd like to leave you with some thoughts on how I think we can translate these imperatives into mission success to operate effectively in cyberspace and how we can achieve these effects that we want. We must first understand our networks and build an effective cyber situational awareness in real time through a common shareable operating picture. We must share indications and warning threat data at net speed among and between the various operating domains. We must synchronize command and control of integrated defensive and offensive capabilities also at net speed. We must leverage all tools of national power to ensure that America and other nations can gain the benefits of free movement in cyberspace, continue to conduct international engagement and diplomacy efforts to improve global governments of this domain, review military doctrine and actions to ensure they are appropriate and effective, and considerable economic policy tools with the involvement of intelligence and law enforcement entities to dissuade those who seek to exploit cyberspace for illicit gain. To achieve these efforts, we must recruit, educate, train, invest in, and retain a cadre of cyber experts who will be conducting seamlessly interoperability, seamless interoperability across the full spectrum of network operations. Finally, we must be able to operate and adapt to situations at net speed, leveraging technology for automated, autonomous decision making. Together, NSA and US Cyber Command will be the intersection of military, intelligence, and information assurance capabilities vital to the nation's comprehensive cybersecurity strategy. We will perform this mission with your trust and confidence 
but we will only succeed by working as part of a coherent team. We will partner with all departments and agencies. We will actively engage all branches of government. And we will exercise our powers and responsibilities under laws in ways designed to ensure that we are truly protecting, not infringing, the privacy and civil liberties of our fellow citizens. I appreciate the opportunity to share my thoughts with you today. Cybersecurity is among the most important current and future challenges DOD and our nation faces. <coughs> Securing our networks is not just a DOD issue. It is a national security issue with implications for all instruments of national power. The Department of Defense, the U.S. Cyber Command, will do its part to protect our great nation from elements wishing to do us harm in cyberspace. As I said at the beginning, it is a privilege and honor to be a member of our cyber team. And now it's time for me to listen to your questions and concerns, and I hope to broaden the dialogue that you at CSIS have promoted on cyberspace issues. I look forward to the interchange, and I thank you very much again for your attention. Great. Well, thank you, General Alexander, and congratulations on the fourth star. Um, if I could ask when people raise their questions, could you do me two favors? Could you identify yourself when you ask them, and could you keep the questions brief so we can respect the general schedule? He does have a few other things to do. Uh, with that, we had one over uh, right in the front row there. Uh, Hi, I'm Dave Fools from the Navy Agency. Can I have the microphone? Yeah, one of the questions. Oh, wait. Hang on. You get a free mic out of this. How do you streamline the, the, your uh, obtaining permission for cyber attacks in time for it to be tactically relevant, particularly against stateless opponents? Uh, that's a, that is a difficult issue. I, I think the, the, question, uh, the question I think everybody heard is how do you streamline um, your counterattacks against CNA attackers, especially if they're stateless? Um, I think I would enlarge it to say, if you can't attribute it, how do you how do you do that? And I think what we have to establish are clear rules of engagement that say what we can stop. Now there are things that we can stop at the boundary, like an intrusion prevention system. That's one part of that strategy, but in the future that may not be specific. So what the department is looking at are what are the standing rules of engagement that we have. Do those comport with the laws, the responsibilities that we have? Can we clearly ar articulate those so that people know and expect what will happen? And I think we have to look at it in two different venues, what we're doing here in peacetime and what we need to do in wartime to support those units that are in combat. And how do we ensure that the combat commanders have the command and control they need? If you think about it, this is the Internet, the digital Internet, is now the command and control system which in the past was our old push to talk radio. And when somebody would jam it, you would try to work through it. Now how are we going to do that in cyberspace? And the answer is, I believe, by working through a set of standing rules of engagement that we'll have and our forces will have. And we've yet to do that. That's something that we have to take on. But you didn't see two sets of uh, rules, uh, wartime check, I do. I think that <coughs> They may all be in one set, but those things that you do in wartime, I think, are going to be different than what you do in peacetime. And I had an opportunity in the hearing, I say this uh, with some level of humor, um, was asked this, qu this specific question by Senator Levin when we came up with three different uh, uh, venues. So how would Cyber Command act when we're at war in another country where both combatants are in one country? And you could attribute the attack to your aggressor, your adversary, and you'd say, now I know I'm going to do these and I'm under one set of rules of engagement. Now what happens, that's, that was case one. Case two was what happens when the adversary uses a neutral country to bounce their attack through. And that is a different set. And it's not unlike warfare where you have two, uh, you have armed conflict going in one state and somebody attacks from a neutral state in. There are laws of land warfare that deal with that. We now have to look at that in light of cyberspace. And then the third is what happens when it's the United States. It's under attack. 
what are the rules for that and how do we go through the threat conditions and stuff to mitigate or defeat that threat. So those were the three conditions and we talked about each one in a different case. And as you, as you think about those, each one of those are going to have different standing rules of engagement. And now, what we don't have is the precision in those standing rules of engagement yet that we need. And we're working through those with the USD policy and up to uh, the deputies committees with the administration. I think we had Harry and then the gentleman in brown. Harry, do you want to? Morning, sir. Harry Radigy from Deloitte. Many of us in this room uh, have worked on situational awareness for many years, common operational pictures and such. And uh, during your comments, you uh, mentioned that uh, situational awareness is an area that definitely needs to be improved. I wonder if you couldn't just briefly describe perhaps where we are now with situational awareness and the areas that you'd like to see improved in the future. Well, I think <coughs> in a nutshell, the hard part is, uh, and I can give you an analogy here, so I'll use the National Training Center. Uh, in the National Training Center, one of the things that they teach our, our land forces is how to see the battlefield and how to react to different situations. And getting the picture for the battalion and brigade commander, as you know, is very, uh, a very necessary part of how they're going to conduct their campaign against an adversary in a very quick battle, battalion on battalion, brigade on brigade, where fights may only last four to six hours. So understanding where your adversary is trying to go, where his reconnaissance goes, where his leading forces go, and all that are some of the stuff that we do at the National Training Center. Now let's put it in cyberspace. We have no situational awareness. It's very limited. Oftentimes our situational awareness is indeed forensics, which means that something has happened. We are now responding to that, and we're saying, okay, something got through. How do you see your network? And as you know, as the, the former director of the Defense Information Systems Agency, a great agency, um, as you looked at that and you tried to look at all your networks, you were, didn't have real-time situational awareness of those 7 million machines and all your networks. And the consequence of that is it was almost policing up after the fact versus mitigating it in real time. So the requirement from my perspective we need real-time situational awareness in our networks to see where something bad is happening and to take action there at that time. That is both a coordination issue amongst the services and agencies and a situational awareness issue. We do not have a COP, a common operating picture for our networks. We need to get there. We need to build that. And I think uh, many uh, in industry would say, yep, we're, we're working towards that, but we don't have that. They, with the breadth that we need. Now, if you take that to Iraq and Afghanistan, you would find the same things. And so we need to fix both. I would focus first on the war fighting ones and then fix the second one, the global one second. Let's get one on the other side of the room here. Is, uh, yeah, go ahead, please. Good morning. Um, my name is Scott Matthews. I'm with the Office of Technology, Department of Commerce. and. The question I have is uh, <coughs> regarding Russia's proposal with significant support in the UN General Assembly for a cyber warfare arms limitation treaty. And the question is whether you think something like that is, is possible. Um, the other part of their proposal is to create basically sovereignty on the net. And how would that, do you think that can work? Uh, how would that impact your, your functions? Let, let me take that in two parts. Yes, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me elaborate, <laughs> if I could. I do think that we have to establish the rules, and I think what Russia has put forward is perhaps a starting point for international debate, not at my level, but at levels above me. And I think when they put that on the table, I think the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State, the administration would take those, carefully consider those, and say, now, what's the, what's the counter proposals from the United States, from China, from Russia, from Europe, from the Middle East? How do we put that on the table? And I think we do have to establish that in the lanes of the road. 
With respect to sovereignty, that's much more complicated. And the reason is, is well, look at our businesses as, a, as an example. They are multinational in nature. And as a consequence, uh, working with business and industry, industry and business working with government, we have opened up a set of uh, vectors that don't easily drop to geographic nation state boundaries. So I think the first may be the way to helping the second, the first part of your question. And I do think it's something that we should and probably will carefully consider. Um, you know, I, I think those are the kinds of things that, that need to be put on the table, talk through, and, uh, and start out as a, call it version 1.0. Randy, <laughs> thanks for the call. Uh, General, uh, Randy Fort, uh, Raytheon, um, congratulations on your promotion and thank you for your service. Uh, in your remarks, you talked about um, the one of your, on your to-do list, discouraging uh, malevolent or bad behavior. Another word for that might be deterrence. Uh, and so I was wondering, uh, since deterrence was one of the issues specified under the Comprehensive National Cybersecurity Initiative um, articulated in the previous administration, and, and, uh, and that issue has continued to receive some attention. I just wondered, what are your thoughts for the potential of deterring the kinds of malevolent behaviors you talked about uh, on the web? Thanks. Yeah, I used discourage because I couldn't pronounce the other word. <laughs> you know, was, I had to break it down into different parts. I, I do think that deterrence, I think, let's, let's go back to the previous question. If nation states agree on what we're going to do to deter malicious actors in cyberspace, that will go a long ways to do this. In this, in this case, it would be the Joint Cyber Investigative Joint Task Force, uh, uh, the uh, FBI's thing that would actually take for within the domestic capabilities, ours, as you, as you well know. They have, uh, they have a great capability, but it's not good enough for what we need. And I think there were some statistics last year that came out that said the amount of money being made in cyberspace has eclipsed the drug trade. And when you think about that, you could say, well, good news, the drug trade is down. I don't think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just the opposite. Uh, as a consequence, I think, uh, putting it from, from a nation's perspective, what's on those networks that we've got to secure? Well, it's our, it's our intellectual property. It's the future of our country future of our industry it's what's going to it will make up the future wealth of this nation we've got to protect it and so i think establishing those rules of the road in cyberspace are going to be key i think that's not a cybercom or a defense department per se's responsibility we may play a part in it but i think that's really going to be state justice in the administration and we have a, a supporting role a technical role uh, but I do think that laying out those rules and then going after those cyber actors who can come from any place in the world, bounce through any place in the world, and attack anyone with uh, virtual impunity are the ones that we have to police up first. And it's a huge issue. We had one all the way in the back there. there. Go ahead. Uh, good morning, General, and uh, again, congratulations on your four-star. Um, Charles Dobb, NISRAD. Some of the adversaries have been working on IPv6 level architecture attacks. Um, since the United States runs on IPv4, do you see some issues in converting over to IPv6, or are we going to look at a hybrid system uh, to do next generation cyber warfare? Um, or do you see that as uh, something that's already underway by multiple agencies? I think there's a lot of folks looking at the transition from IPv4 to 6. I think it's something that we will have to do at some point, a question of security. You've hit all the key points. Um, you know, it is kind of interesting when you ask that, though. I can remember somebody, we were trying to explain why we aren't at IPv6 in some of our capabilities and why we're at IPv4, and they said, well, why don't you have a middle road? Why don't you go to IPv5? <laughs> and then he thought, okay, so, uh, so I'm not going to answer it that way. <laughs> um, Although, on average, that's probably where you want to be. It's, it doesn't exist. So <clears throat> I do think it's something that we're going to work our way through. I think you can see technically we're going to have to make those moves there. The number of addresses and things like that are key, and we've got to come up with some of that. I'm not sure, uh, and you probably are as aware 
as I am, because there's a lot of debate. Do we do we take a step beyond that? And what's that step going to be? I think that's still open for discussion. But clearly, you're going to have to take some of the benefits of IPv6, the addressing and other things. Look at, you know, I I admitted that I have an iPad, um, and when you start to think about the tremendous capabilities that we have out there, and you think about all these tools, your iPhones, and all these things that are coming out, the computing on the edge is growing huge. We're going to have to account for that, and I think that's the, that's going to drive us down that road. I just don't know where it's going to end up. We had a lady over at Atlanta Audit Center meeting. Good morning, sir. Kat Hollis, Institute for Defense Analysis. Uh, I have a question, and I think it's pretty inherent, and it's been touched on a little bit. Um, there's a vulnerability in cyber that I think we kind of ignore, which comes along with all the social engineering posed by our allies, our non-allies, other countries in the world. Um, nation states with little or no division between academia, industry, and government. Uh, students raised with the goal of promoting their government's goals. Uh, there's little or no repercussion for them. In fact, it's looked at in terms of probably a boon to their academic endeavors or their industrial endeavors if they can show ways that either they can get into, how they can compromise, how they can gain access into our networks, international networks, whether they're government, whether they're industry. Um, my concern is how is, is, is Cyber Command, along with the other agencies, as long, along with industry in the United States, actually going to address this? Because I think as we look in the future, that's where our real threat lies. These are people brought up in how to do what we're trying to learn how to do. I think it goes back to the commerce issue that was asked earlier. I think the way to address that is by establishing the rules of the road. It's going to take all countries to get together and fix that. And when all countries can come up and agree, this is going to be the way we're going to operate and the way we're going to defend and the way we're going to do this, and we all agree to it, that will go a long way towards getting there. And the key will be how do we ensure that we all enforce it equally. That's going to be the hard part. Um, and I think we're, we're going to start walking down that road. That is not a U.S. Cybercom lead, uh, as I stated earlier. I think that's going to be state, the administration, and others. I think it's an international issue that has to be addressed and put on the table. Uh, we have someone in the second row there. The whole row of them. Siobhan Gorman with the Wall Street Journal. Thank you for doing this, sir. Um, I had a follow-up on the situational awareness question. I was wondering what your role is in developing better situational awareness inside the U.S. sort of nationally. And in addition to that, what is the government's sort of role broadly in terms of ensuring privacy protection as it tries to get a better handle on the problem? Okay, well, <coughs> a, couple, a couple parts. Let me handle first my role with respect to the military networks and how we get situational awareness there. In, in a war zone, as I said, we gave three, three cases. In a war zone, the commander has to have confidence in his command and control system. Increasingly, our intelligence, our operations, our weapons platforms are all being brought together in cyberspace. We have to have confidence that that space is secure and whoever's running that space for that commander in that area has to know that that's secure. You can't afford to lose it. Tremendous vulnerabilities. Uh, so my responsibility in that regard is to help articulate the requirements in the wartime effort, and then if you think about the Defense Department networks globally, in the Defense Department's networks. That's my role. If you look at the rest of the government, that's where Phil Reitinger and his folks are going to come in and say, how do I now help the other government departments and agencies see their network so that they can operate and defend those just as the military will defend its. Our responsibility is to assist them if they ask for it, request for assistance, request for technical assistance. We'll provide that assistance. I, I think from a national perspective, if we come up with a situational awareness tool, call it uh, X, uh, that we shouldn't have each other department pay to have X developed for them too. Perhaps we could all use it, Microsoft Office or something like that. Um, I think that's the way to go through it. Now, your third question, third part of that, civil liberties and privacy. I think the key in this is oversight. Now, this is a really a tough issue when you think about civil liberties and privacy when you're talking about classified information and areas. 
And so the way we've set up the oversight on that is by having a set of oversight mechanisms by all branches of the government. Government, the court system, and Congress all need to play a part in that and know that the actions that we're taking comport with law and protect the civil liberties and privacy of our people. Now, there's, there's issues that you get into that, and you know you can take it from a domestic side, so what's the FBI do when it gets a warrant, and what do we do with the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act court? Both of those now get into classified areas with oversight. And so I think we do that very well. The hard part is we can't go out and tell everybody exactly what we did or we give up a capability that may be extremely useful in protecting our country and our allies. And so that's the, the real, what I see as the, the two things that we balance. And so I do spend a lot of time with the court and with Congress explaining exactly what we're doing, where we have issues, where there needs to be change, um, what we can and cannot do. And we put that up to the court and we get things back from the court. I think it is growing and getting better. We spend a lot of time on that. The, the hard part, we can't tell everybody what we're doing. It, it would be analogous to you explaining how you defended your system, your computer system. You say, I'm defending my computer system using the following uh, steps, one, two, three, four. The adversary will say, thank you, one, two, three, four. Now I know how to get around it, and within a day they're through. That's the problem that we face. And so I think the real key to the issue, how do we build the confidence that we're doing it right with the American people, with Congress and everyone else? That's going to be the hard part. You play a key role in that. How do we explain it without giving up things that would cause us to have an attack or something go through while we can currently protect our civil liberties and privacy? You know, I have, I have four daughters uh, and, uh, as we said, 12 grandchildren. And my daughters are huge users of this area and space, and, and uh, they like their civil liberties and privacy too. And we want to ensure that they have that. That's one of the key foundations that this nation was built on and that we take an oath to protect, and we take that very seriously. You know, I'm cognizant of the general's time, and he's been very generous, so maybe two more questions. You think that'll work? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how about if we get our no there? I'll have to, I'll have to do an in-house question. I think we can go about 10 more minutes. Yeah. Okay. Honorable Borgraf, CSIS General. About 15 years ago, a great deal was written about the threat of cyber warfare, cyber terrorism, the Marsh Commission. A monograph was produced by CSIS. I wonder why it took 15 years to stand up your command. <laughs> uh, uh, ne next question. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think part of it had to do is they had to teach me to read along the way, uh, and so that takes some time. Um, uh, you know, that's, that's a tough question to answer. I think it's a combination of things. When was the department ready to stand it up? Uh, and uh, how did we get there along the way? Um, it is interesting to look at this, and, and I do think it merits a, a more serious part of, of the answer. It's not like we, this was a step function in getting to U.S. Cyber Command that uh, the 21st, we said, U.S. Uh, no Cyber Command, no Cyber, boom, we're here. If you go back to 2002, when you saw the department wrestling with how are we going to do this, what we did is we said, well, first, which combatant command is going to have the responsibility? We looked at that and went to Spacecom, went to U.S. Stratcom. Stratcom said, so how am I going to do this? I need technical expertise. Who has technical expertise? They picked DISA. Because then General, were you there at that time? So you see General Radege was there. They gave him the Global Network Ops, the Defend and Operate mission. They said, now who has, who can help with the offense? And they looked at NSA, and they dual-hatted both, and then the rest is as I explained. But it takes time to evolve it, so it's not something that we just jumped into. And I think it's a, a well-thought-out approach, and we are one step further along, and I think it's going pretty good. The lady in the center row there, is that Kate? Hi, Kate. Hi, Kate Martin from the Center for uh, National Security Studies, and I wanted to thank you, General, for your 
commitment to protecting civil liberties and privacy and your recognition of the importance of oversight by the court and the Congress and acknowledge that the problem of protecting national security classified information is very difficult and important in this field. Um, but ask you whether in, uh, nevertheless, in the last, in the last administration, I think lots of members of Congress as well as those of us in the um, civil liberties community concluded that in fact um, the intelligence capabilities were illegally trained on U.S. citizens. And so the question becomes, despite those oversight mechanisms, how to prevent that from happening again and whether or not you plan to undertake an initiative to look at the possibility of greater public transparency given the uh, necessity for national security secrecy in this field in order to help build the public confidence that you referred to? Well, that's an easy question. I'm going to turn it over to now. <laughs> <coughs> First, um, you made some statements that I don't agree 100% with, so I'm going to just put it back in my words if I could. Illegal uh, versus uh, the constitutional Article 1, Article 2, Article 3. Now, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I just admitted that I just learned to read, so I'm not a lawyer. Uh, so what are the roles of the three branches of the government and how do we do that? And what are the roles and responsibility for the, the president to do his job? What are the roles for Congress and what are the roles for the court are articulated in our Constitution? And what we have is a constitutional issue that we've put down on the table. If you take 9-11, a, a tragic event for our country, the question is how do we ensure that we don't have another terrorist attack and we don't give up our civil liberties and privacy? Both of those are national objectives that we want to achieve. And when you look at that, are ones that we're trying to achieve. So. I think what I can do is jump forward. It's hard for me to jump backwards because I came in in the middle of the, the last debate and say, here's, here's my opinion, the way to do this in the future. Transparency at the classified level between Congress, the court, and the administration and what we're doing so that all three agree 100% that this is the right way. And I think that's the first and the most important step that we have, and I think we're doing that. We spend a lot of time with the court with Congress and the administration, with the oversight committees, to ensure they know what we're doing, why we're doing it, and debate it there in a classified setting. And then with the court, go forward with the court and say what we're trying to do. I think the American people should be, would be very pleased to know the way we're doing it. In fact, some would say, why does it take you so long? And I think the answer is, these are tough issues. You know, we have a lot of lawyers uh, at NSA and in the nation, all good people, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> you know, if we divided the room in half and put half the lawyers on one side and half on the other, we could debate this, it, this issue until we all go to sleep. And so the issue I think that we have, the one that we really face, the one that you're driving at, is where our country wants to be. We want to protect, you know, the, the some say the Constitution is not a suicide pact, and I agree. But it's also not something that we're just going to throw out our civil liberties and privacy. We were built on that. That's how our country was built. We want to ensure that we do our part to it. My responsibility as the director of NSA is to ensure that what we do comports with law. And so every action that we take, we have legal reviews of it all the way up and down. And as I said, when you look at that, there are a lot of legal reviews that go into this, many of them which are classified for great reasons. Um, bottom line, I think we're doing this right. Doesn't mean that we won't make a mistake. But from my perspective, I could tell you that we spend an awful lot of time ensuring that we're doing it both to protect the country and everything that we can on that side and to protect civil liberties and privacy. And uh, I'll tell you, I sleep good at night because of that. We, um, we uh, started this series, uh, AT&T has uh, helped us to underwrite it and helped us uh, 
support it. And we started this series in uh, September of 2009 with Deputy Secretary Lin, who was supposed to announce the creation of Cyber Command here. He did. And I'm really grateful that we finally, uh, sometime later, got the results. I think that was a tremendous uh, speech. Thank you very much for taking these questions, which were all difficult and good. And if you can join me in a round of applause. Thank you.